Wobbles, and I'm a horticulturalist and the assistant garden center manager here at Campbell and Ferrara. And today we're going to be talking about gardening for beginners. So the main, the main point that I want you to get out of today, the key to successful gardening, is learning how to put the right plant in the right place. And if you're able to do this, uh, what you'll do is you'll save your plant a lot of trouble. Because if it's in the wrong setting, it's going to be stressed out. If there's too much sun, not enough water, anything like that, your plant is going to be putting all of its resources just to protecting itself, um, which means that it's not going to be able to handle um, an attack from insects or from a disease. Also, there'll be fewer resources available for the beautiful flowers that you want it to produce, uh, for new growth to make your trees grow taller and wider. Uh, and also, if you're, especially if you're doing something like vegetables or blueberries, there'll be less energy in that plant for fruit production. So the key here is learning how to get your plant into the appropriate location on your property. So how do you do that? Uh, basically, what you need to do is you need to look at your property and you need to sort of take stock of the things that you can control and the things that you can't control. And you want to work within the framework of those aspects of your landscape that you're stuck with and you want to use the other things that you can control to ameliorate your conditions, to improve them. So looking first at the things that you're stuck with. You're stuck with your location. We're here in Northern Virginia. We're not down in Florida. We're not in California. We're not in Russia. We're, we're stuck with a certain uh, set of constraints because of our location. Uh, also, on your site, unless you're willing to cut down trees or put up shade structures, you're stuck with a sort of general set of sunlight requirements. Uh, also, when it comes to a plant, you can't change the plant's basic size, shape, that sort of thing. Um, a pansy will always be a pansy. It will never be a dogwood, and vice versa. So within, within a given plant, uh, you're stuck with a certain set of traits. So looking first at our location. So your geographic location is going to determine your climate. When we talk about climate, we talk about lots of different things that are important to plants, like your maximum and your min and minimum temperatures. How cold does it get in the winter, and how hot does it get in the summer? And we're also looking at the angle and the intensity of the sun. So if we're here in Virginia, we're closer to the equator, and so we're getting more intense sun than if we were in Alaska or somewhere much further north. So this means when we get direct overhead sun you know, for long periods of time in the summer, it's much more stressful on a plant than it would be if you were to get the same duration of sunlight in a further north climate. Uh, also, we're talking about precipitation. This refers both to the just general amount of precipitation uh, and the annual patterns. So here in the Washington, D.C. area, we tend to have, uh, in the spring, sort of longer, gentler um, rains, uh, whereas in the summer, we have these sort of short burst uh, that are more intense than these thunderstorms. Uh, however, we have, you know, generally decent rain throughout the year. And the main difference is the temperature. So we may get snow or ice in winter, whereas we'll get rain in the spring and summer. Uh, whereas if you compare that to something like Washington State, they'll have a sort of a lesser range of temperatures, um, and they may have the same amount of rainfall on an annual basis, but the way that they experience seasons is that they have basically six months of drought and six months where it pretty much rains all the time. And so even if we both get you know, one foot of rain, we get it in very different ways. And so that's another thing that, as a gardener, you can't control. And so you have to take that into account when you're choosing plants for your backyard. So what we're looking at here is from the US Department of Agriculture. This is a hardiness map. And if you've ever looked at a plant tag or talked to people about plants, you've probably heard them mention a hardiness zone. And that's what that, those numbers come from this map. And it divides the United States into uh, 10 or 11 different zones. And these zones are based on the minimum temperature in winter, the average minimum temperature. Uh, and we in Northern Virginia here are in zone 7. Photosynthesis is how plants make their food. So without the appropriate amount of light, your plant will effectively starve. Uh, also, when we talk about light, we talk about transpiration. Uh, and this is sort of the, the flip side uh, to photosynthesis. So whenever photosynthesis is occurring, transpiration is also occurring. And that's how plants create uh, movement of water. 
And so that's how they get water from the roots to the leaves. And so if there's no light or if there's an inappropriate amount of light, you're going to have problems with the water supply to your plant. And the thing to keep in mind here is that plants are adapted to a specific set of light conditions. In the morning, I would go out and I would look at my backyard and I would say, OK, so at this time, you know, at 8 o'clock in the morning, I have sunlight you know, on this half of the yard. But the rest of it is in shade. And so I'd just sort of draw that line and I'd mark it down as it's in sunlight right now. A couple hours later in the afternoon, I'll come back and I'll do the same thing. And I'll say, OK, so this area is now getting shade and the sun has shifted over to my patio in this other section of the yard. And so I'll just sort of draw that in and check it off as afternoon sun. And then I'll come back again a third time later in the day and look and I'll say, well, this area is still in shade and this area is now getting the late day sun. And so once I have this map set up, I have a really good idea of what's going on in my yard during the day. And because of this, I'm able to locate my plants in the appropriate way. So the last thing we want to talk about as far as the factors that you are sort of limited by are the plants themselves. And so when we talk about plants, we usually divide them into a couple of basic categories. Um, the first is an annual. This is a plant that's going to live for one season. Uh, once it dies, it will not come back. Uh, these are things like petunias, pansies, geraniums, uh, sort of those typical bright flowers that you think of in the spring and the summer. Uh, the nice thing about annuals is that they'll stay fairly small. They're great for containers. And when they flower, they tend to flower for the entire growing season. So you put your geraniums in in May, and you can keep them all the way through August. Uh, the next class that we like to talk about is perennials, like the coral bells here. Uh, these can get a little bit larger, but these are plants that are going to return each year. So they'll come up in the spring. They'll usually bloom for a period of about three weeks to a month. Um, and then they'll die back, usually, <clears throat> excuse me, at frost. Uh, there are some varieties that are evergreen, but in general you'll see that cycle where they come up in the spring, flower at some point during the spring or summer, die back at frost, and then return the next year. Our next class is the shrubs. And these are plants that have, um, that have bark, that have you know, a woody structure to them. Uh, and these are going to live for decades. Some of them will live for, for centuries if, if cared for properly. Um, uh, the last class is trees. And these can live, again, decades, centuries. Some of the oldest living things on Earth are trees. Um, and again, woody, they have, they have bark. Uh, they're different from shrubs in that, again, they usually have one central trunk. Um, and their branches are larger, their structure is larger. Again, lots of them will flower. Think of fruit trees, um, your flowering cherries, dogwoods, red buds, things like that. And again, many of them are evergreen, you know, pine trees, conifers, things of that nature. So TAG will almost always tell you the mature height of the plant. And this is extremely important uh, when you're planting your garden because often when you buy, you know, especially a tree or a shrub, you're starting with a fairly small plant. So you may be purchasing an azalea that's only you know, 18 to 24 inches now, but could grow to four or five feet. Uh, or again, with a dogwood, you may start with one that's you know, about three feet tall, and that'll grow to be 20 feet tall and 15 feet wide. So knowing the mature height of the plant is really important. And again, that also plays into the spacing. So if you're going to do a line of five azaleas, you want to know how much space to leave in between them so that there's room for them to grow. Uh, without interacting with each other too much, without overlapping, without creating too much shading. Also, this tag will tell you the bloom season. So if you're looking at your garden and you realize that you, know, you have a lot of stuff and early in spring your garden looks great, but by the time we get into June and July, there's just not a lot happening. Um, so you go to your garden center and you say, you know, I need something that's going to bloom during the summer. And your, the tag will give you that information. The tag will also let you know the sunlight requirements, whether this plant prefers full sun, full shade, or something in between. Uh, as a rule of thumb, we think of six hours or more being full sun. Uh, we consider you know, four hours to be partial sun, partial shade. And anything below two hours, we really consider to be pretty full shade. Uh, these tags will also often let you know desirable traits of the plants, whether it's deer-resistant, 
evergreen, whether its flowers attract pollinators, that sort of thing. And then lastly, it'll usually give you some information about some specific care instructions for the plant, uh, whether it requires a lot of water, uh, if it's prone to any particular diseases, so that you can take measures to, to help you be successful. Uh, underwatering and overwatering equally are culprits of, of plant problems. And the unfortunate thing is it's pretty difficult to tell the difference between the symptoms. The symptoms are almost identical. Uh, so looking first at underwatering, I mean, plants are like people um, in, in that we're both composed primarily of water. And without water, your cells will collapse. You'll see the leaves start to wilt on your plant. Eventually, they'll fall off. And then the ultimate result is that your plant will die. Uh, if we look at underwatering, or sorry, excuse me, overwatering, uh, what happens here is that uh, if you overwater your plant, basically all of the air spaces in your soil fill with water. And when that happens, the roots on the plant suffocate, they rot, they die, and then you're left with a plant that has no way to take up water. And so again, you'll start to see the leaves will wilt, and then they'll fall off, and eventually it will lead to the plant's death. Next thing we want to talk about uh, that you can work on controlling is your soil. So your soil type is related to soil moisture, uh, to the nutrient availability, and also to the acidity or the pH of your soil. So looking at a couple different soil types here, uh, you can see that these soils are different in their color, they're different in their texture, and they're also different in their composition. So what we're looking at is here on the right is a sandy soil. Uh, in the middle, we're looking at a nice composted soil. And on the left there, we're looking at a very heavy clay soil. So in terms of moisture retention, as we go from the right to the left here, the sand holds very little water. Uh, the compost is somewhere in between. Uh, it's really sort of your ideal. And the problem that we have with clay is moisture retention. It holds water like an iron sponge. Uh, something like compost, leaf mold, manure, all these things can be added to your soil to improve the quality. And it helps with, again, the moisture retention, either increasing or decreasing it, depending on your starting point. Uh, it's going to add nutrients to the soil. If you're adding organic matter, this is going to be broken down further over time and makes those nutrients available to plants. Uh, and also just improves the texture of your soil. And this brings us to the soil pH, or the soil acidity. So this refers to uh, the concentration of hydrogen ions in your soil. So most plants prefer a slightly acidic soil. Uh, however, some of them will like, are, are a little bit tricky. Some of them like it a little more acidic, some of them like it a little less acidic. Uh, in Virginia, our soils range anywhere from 2 to 8 on that pH scale. Uh, but in general, you'll find for the most part, our soils are sort of between 5 and 5.5. Five and uh, so the next thing we want to talk about is fertilizer. So if you've ever looked at a package of fertilizer, you probably notice that it has this series of three numbers on it. This one is 3103. And what that refers to is the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium, or the NPK, in this bottle. And it's actually, a, those numbers are a percentage. So if you have a 10-pound bag of fertilizer, and it's a 10-10-10, that means that in that bag, you have one pound of nitrogen, one pound of phosphorus, and one pound of potassium. So if we look here at plant starter, this is something that helps establish your plants. We see that it, the second number is the highest. It's a 3103. So that means it's high in phosphorus. So this is high in something that's going to help get your roots established. So it does, as the name says, it helps start your plants. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about today is pest control. Uh, so there are lots of sort of different and very strong feelings about pest control. So we're going to try to look at a couple different perspectives and just give you sort of the basics on giving you the information so that you can make those decisions for how you want to handle it. Uh, and so once you have identified the pest, choosing your treatment is, is the next option, knowing if you want it to be an organic treatment or if you just you know, want to bomb the plant and take care of the insect and get it all out of the way. These are, these are valid options. Um, but you're going to need to choose the product based on uh, you know, your personal preferences, but also on the pest itself. The stage of life, you use different products. If it's you know, in a larval or caterpillar stage, than you would if it's in a flying winged insect phase. 
Uh, also, you want to keep in mind the severity of the infestation. If you just have you know, one or two bugs, you don't need to spray it with an entire bottle of insecticide. Uh, whereas if you have a really severe infestation, you may need a product that's a little bit stronger in order to handle that. Uh, the next step then is that you want to read that label on the pesticide container and you want to apply it at the appropriate level and if it tells you anything about protective equipment or something that you need to wear, those are all things that you need to follow. So thank you all for coming today. And again, my name is Jane Wobbles and I'm the assistant manager here at the Garden Center and we hope to see you, see you out in the Garden Center this spring and summer.